morning. Welcome to Trinity on the 14th Sunday after Pentecost. So glad you're joining us. Would you join me for worship beginning on page 355? Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that they may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. be with you. Kneeling, let us pray. O God, because without you we are not able to please you, mercifully grant that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from Jeremiah. At that time, it will be said to this people and to Jerusalem, a hot wind comes from me out of the bare heights in the desert toward my poor people, not to winnow or cleanse, a wind too strong for that. Now it is I who speak in judgment against them, for my people are foolish. They do not know me, they are stupid children. They have no understanding. They are skilled in doing evil, but do not know how to do good. I looked on the earth, and lo, it was a waste and a void, and to the heavens, and they had no light. And I looked on the mountains, and lo, they were quaking, and all the hills moved to and fro. I looked, and lo, there was no one at all, and all the birds of the air had fled. I looked, and lo, the fruitful land was de desert, and all its cities were laid in ruins before the Lord, before his fierce anger. For thus says the Lord, the whole land shall be desolation, yet I will not make a full end. Because of this, the earth shall mourn, and the heavens above grow black. For I have spoken, I have purposed. I have not relented, nor will I turn back. The word of the Lord. Psalm 14. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. All are corrupt and commit abominable acts. There is none who does any good. The Lord looks down from heaven upon us all to see if there is anyone who is wise, 
if there is one who seeks, seeks after God. Everyone has proved faithless. All alike have turned bad. There is none who does good. No, not one. Have they no knowledge, all those evildoers, who eat up my people like bread and do not call upon the Lord? See how they tremble with fear, because God is in the company of the righteous. Their aim is to confound the plans of the afflicted, but the Lord is their refuge. Oh, that Israel's deliverance would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, Jacob will rejoice and Israel will be glad. A reading from 1 Timothy. I am grateful to Christ Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me, because he judged me faithful and appointed me to his service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and in the grace of our Lord overflowed for me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am for foremost. But for that very reason I received mercy, so that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ must display the utmost patience, making me an example to those who would come to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he came home, he calls together his friends and neighbors and says to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance? Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors and says, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy in the presence of angels of God, over one sinner who repents. The Gospel of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, may the words of my mouth, the meditation of all of our hearts, be pleasing to you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning, friends. I'm glad you're joining us on the virtual service. We're going to be looking at our Gospel passage today. And the picks up, Jesus starts immediately out of the gate with a fight. (laughs) Typical Jesus, right? No, he doesn't mean to start a fight, but perhaps he was tired of all the grumbling going on around him. He's tired of the religious thinking they get a pass because their heritage or a pass because they sin differently. In fact, they don't see their own sin in all. So Jesus tells them a story where he levels the playing field. And when he is done, everyone is standing there exposed. What are they today? What are you to do when you become the empire with no, the emperor with no clothes? Like these religious leaders here in our scripture passage today. You want to know what you do? You return to Jesus. Better yet, you fall back onto Jesus entering Christ, the Good Shepherd, as the parable transitions and unfolds from the image of a bad shepherd, the unbelieving religious leaders, to a good shepherd, which is Christ, there is a stark and glaring theological contrast between unfaithful shepherds and faithful shepherds. And two things actually strike me in this passage. Number one, the shepherd seeks the lost sheep. The sheep don't try to find the shepherd. The shepherd seeks the lost sheep. We can't find him. There's a lot of talk today, for instance, about people going on spiritual journeys where we are infatuated with this idea of journey. And I can fix myself. I can get myself better. It's actually part of our Western uh, mindset, to be honest. There was a study several years ago where all the major car manufacturers studied people like you to find out what it is they're drawn to, they want to do. And they found out that everyone in the West is looking for a journey. And so they begin to name cars like the Honda Odyssey, so that you can have an Odyssey of your own. Or there's the car, the Pathfinder, or the Forerunner, or the Quest, or the Landover. And these vehicles are not named for their ability of the vehicle and what it can do. It's not a purpose of it getting from A to B, but it was a way to get into the Western psyche of people because at the end of the day, we're looking for journey. And so they named these vehicles in a way to tap into that a little bit. But those journeys, if guided by the self and the whims of the moment, can only lead away from the Good Shepherd. Listen, friends, we don't seek him. He seeks us. We do not make a decision for him. He decides to find us. It's all the work of the God for us in Christ. He leaves the 99, but there to find the one. 
to find the one that's the farthest gone. But there's a second thing that shocks me that stands out. Number two, the good shepherd pays a price to carry the sheep back to the village. If it's not found and carried back, it'll die. And the shepherd risks his life to find the animal and pick it up. Mind you, this animal probably weighed about 70 pounds. And then he carries it all the way back to the flock. It's a mark of his strength, his courage, his character. And the shepherd, what does he do when he finds it? He rejoices when he finds his sheep, for his work has barely begun when he has located this lost animal. The image of the shepherd's sacrifice for the sheep is captured in early Christian art. If you've ever studied early Christian art, you'll see that picture a lot where Jesus is pictured with a sheep on his shoulders, so to speak. I was, several years ago, Jan and I were in Israel, and one of the museums was featuring this type of art. And there were these three beautiful pictures that were depicted that day. And one of them just completely leveled me. It was a man, Jesus, and he had this animal that was so big, it was bigger than him. It was a massive sheep on the shoulders of this good-sized Jesus. And you look closer at his face, one would have thought he would have been like huffing and puffing and trying to do this and laboring. You see the strong Jesus, willing and able to save, not with a frown on his face or a disappointing look because the sheep had wandered off. You know what Jesus' face looked like? And it's what I couldn't stop staring at. He had a smile on his face. He was so happy to have that sheep back. Jesus is the good shepherd who gives all of his sheep, who gives for all of his sheep. He leaves the the, the, the masses to find the one. He sought us when we were lost. He brought us to repentance and faith. And he carried us back to the church pastures He leads us beside the still waters of our baptism. He absolves our sins, and he feeds us the cup that runneth over at the Lord's Supper. And it's all the duty and the delight of him. Hebrews 12, 2 says, He endured the cross and scorned its shame for you. But what happens when we return home? What happens when the Good Shepherd finally makes it home? Is he exhausted? Does he punish the sheep? No. The scripture says that when the shepherd comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors and says to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. Again, remember the context of the parable. Jesus was eating with tax collectors and sinners and under scrutiny from the Pharisees and the scribes. The image of the good shepherd rejoicing with friends and neighbors over the lost sheep said something about Jesus. Remember, Jesus had already highly offended these self-appointed righteous men by shining a positive light on the vocation of shepherd. No law-abiding Pharisee could do this job. But then he took it a step further, and he referred to all humanity as sheep. Everybody knew that sheep were dumb, a little bit ignorant, unable to defend themselves from the wolf. What an insult this was to the highbrow religious group. But to top it, he says, Rejoice with me, for I have found my lost sheep. Not rejoice with me because I have 99 righteous sheep that stayed in the pen. And the underlining statement being, not only are you a sheep, but you are prone to wonder. And when you do, the good shepherd comes and he finds you. This was the biggest jab of all to clarify that they don't even have the power to find God. This was a massive blow as it hit them below the belt of their self-righteousness. You see, their religious system was centered around what they did for God, how they stayed close to God, how they followed the rules and followed His commands. And outwardly, they did did the best they could within their heart. But their hearts were far gone. Their hearts had wandered into the far country. They were nothing more than whitewashed tombs at this point that reeked of death. Matthew 23, 27. Friends, today we are the wanderers. We are the sheep. We are not the shepherds who go out and find the lost sheep. 
We Christians love, we love to paint ourselves into the seat, especially the clergy. I can't tell you how many times I've heard this passage taught that we at clergy conferences in a wrong way, and it's always taught as a way to guilt the priest into being better shepherds to their flock, guilting them into taking on responsibilities that was never meant for them to take on. The prophet Isaiah says, In 53.6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. But praise God, the good shepherd and the good news is this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And in this passage, the good shepherd leaves the 99 for one lost, scared, alone, out for dead sheep. Jesus was foretelling what he was about to do for the world. I'm going to go into the wilderness of death, and I'm going to give my life so that I can find you, so that you will never be alone in the wilderness of death. Your good shepherd, in fact, does not leave you. He never forsakes us, and he is on mission to find us. He's on mission to find his sheep. And when he does, verse 6, He rejoices. I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Joy over one repentant sinner. The 99 unbelieving Jews who kept the law but did not repent had no place at Jesus' table. They were the unclean ones for they were still living in the filth of their sin and unbelief. But the repentant tax collectors and the repentant prostitutes and alcoholics and drug addicts and workaholics and the angry and the proud, they had a place. They had a seat at the table of grace. And in due time, the Gentiles, you and me, had a place at God's table. Here we see the pattern of the Christian life is found is finding the loss and rejoicing with them. The pattern of our Christian experience. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. You know, our world is full of lost sheep because this describes the human condition separated from Jesus. And when we really begin to realize that we are all in that boat, together lost and broken by sin's grip, We begin to see the brokenness around us. And rather than showing judgment to fellow sheep, we can show love and forgiveness. Not an easy task, especially if you have been burned or bitten by a fellow sheep. But part of the healing and sanctifying roles is to extend forgiveness. Extend forgiveness to those who don't, in your eyes, deserve it. We all have people in relationships like this some that go way back. You know, one of the hardest things to do is to love our neighbor as ourself, especially our close neighbors like family. I shared with you a few Sundays back of my growing up with an alcoholic father and stepfather. One was absent, the other was abusive, and I could choose to hold a grudge. I could choose to be angry and mad, to play the victim, and to blame every bad decision I make on life on that. And it wouldn't change the way God loved me. That's the ironic thing. Nothing will change that. But I could choose to forgive, to let go, to see those men in my life as sheep who are also affected by sin's condition. And rather than holding hate toward them or in my heart, I could hold mercy and forgiveness. God, praise the Lord for this, God graced me a long time ago with the word forgiveness. And one of the hardest things I ever did was sit across the table from my stepfather and forgive him, to let go, to walk away from the bitterness and the rage, and to begin asking God to heal me and change me. Not him, change me. To give me love where there was hate to draw my sinful stepfather back to the fold. And it's taken a long time. It wasn't overnight. But today, I can honestly say that I would rejoice 
I would rejoice with the angels if you were to repent and fall back on Jesus. Who is it for you? Who is it in your life that has hurt you so bad? The worst of the worst, who has wounded and wa- you and has wandered you. Who is it? Christ wants to help you forgive. You see, in the passage, the law accuses us as one of the 99, but the gospel sets us free as the one whom Jesus went after. You see, we are both the righteous ones and the lost ones, and what Jesus was ultimately trying to do was to show his reader and show us that we are sinful, self-righteous, dumb sheep who wander away from the good shepherd. We are all in this boat, and we all need Christ. Today, as we transition to our communion, let us remember that this table is coming to us. This table comes to us. It comes to you. We don't come to it because we deserve it. It comes to us because we desperately need it. So I invite you, during our confession in just a moment, repent, and then fall into the embrace of the table of grace and receive afresh and anew from your good shepherd and ask him to give you forgiveness and love. And he'll do it. Why? Because you're his beloved sheep. Amen. Well, isn't it good news to know that Jesus left everything? He left heaven to come and find you. And so with joy in our hearts, let us stand and together profess what we believe through the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us be generous and ready to share with prayer all the needs of the world. For Mark, our bishop-elect, Susan and Jennifer, our bishops, Jonathan, our priest, for this holy gathering and for the people of God in every place. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For mercy, justice, and peace among all peoples. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For abundant fruits of the earth and for this good and bountiful world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our community, for those who live in it, and for the families, companions, and for all those we love, especially those named on our parish prayer list. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the poor at our gates and for those in desperate need, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those who rest in Christ and for all the departed, those whom we now name and remember in the silence of our hearts, 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lifting our voices with all creation and with all the saints, let us offer ourselves and one another to the living God through Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of Moses and the prophets, hear the prayers we offer this day and grant us belief through your Son, risen from the departed, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let's greet each other in peace. Good morning. I'm so glad you're joining us today at Trinity. I hope you've had a wonderful week. Would you do me a favor? Send me a quick note letting me know that you've watched this show today and let me know how I can best pray for you. I do hope and I pray that you know that you are the lost sheep that Jesus left glory to find. And he loves you. He knows your name. And your name now is written in the book of life. So enjoy your forgiveness. A couple of quick announcements for you. We kicked off our year this past week. If you were not here live with us, you did not realize, but we had a wonderful party out in the Bishop's Garden. We signed up for Sunday school classes and Bible studies and service opportunities. And so if you missed out on that, I invite you to be a part of that. Let me know and we'll get you signed up in one of those two things. Next week, we kick off our education hour. Children's Sunday School starts with Miss Susan. She's got a wonderful program lined up for this fall on the fruit of the Spirit. It's going to be a lot of fun. I invite you to get your kids here no matter what it takes. And now let us come to the table where once again we get to come and have a meal with Jesus. And we get to dine with him and spend time with him and feed on him so that when we leave here, We leave here knowing that all is right with God. And so come to the table. Jesus is your host.
All things come of thee, O Lord. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and good and a joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink this, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mysteries of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension. We offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ hath taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Friends, these are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. If you'll please join me for our post-communion prayer. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. And now, may the peace of God be on each one of you this day, and until we meet again, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit, Alleluia, alleluia.